This is Duke University. Global trade and environmental justice. Human rights China issues today. are still... The term Ubuntu. A the Alien and Sedition accident. He's making inferential discoveries. The importance of an archive. The John Hope Franklin Center. I s cleverly agreed to moderate this panel because I was tired of hearing myself, and I'm sure you're tired of hearing me too. So I'm just going to um, uh, introduce our roundtable participants. And we had planned this as a way to open up the discussion. Um, I've, we've asked our participants here um, to just briefly uh, reflect on, react to uh, what has happened, uh, what we've been talking about all day. And and, uh, and uh, last night with the interfaith service and with Scott Horton's talk, and then really open it up um, with the idea uh, of starting to look forward and what do we do next? We have a, a ton of information. We have a wealth of experiences that have been brought here, and uh, and now it's time uh, to really begin to ask the questions about what do we do. At the beginning of the day, we handed out this questions for April 9th. Josh has some more copies if you need need uh, a copy. And again, we just use this as kind of a reference point for our thinking as we go ahead. Um, so if you if you don't have a copy, just uh, get one, take a look. And and again, this is not meant to limit debate. It's meant to 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 prod certain certain kinds of questions and to help us. Um, begin a planning process. Um, we decided to go in the order uh, that's in the agenda, with the exception of Tony Asion, who unfortunately had to leave uh, because of illness. Uh, but we will be involving him as we go forward. He is the director of El Pueblo, which is a Latino organization many of you are familiar with. Um, so Sarah is going to start. Uh, Sarah Shields uh, teaches the history of the Middle East at the University of North Carolina. At Chapel Hill, uh, her research focuses on the development of collective identities during the 1920s and 30s in Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. She's been named a favorite geek. You put that in your bio. <laughs> um, Which is itself proof. Right, right, exactly. It's, what more do you need? Uh, she's currently directing um, a year-long exploration of diversity and conformity in Muslim societies. Uh, then she's going to be followed by Eric is it got Mueller or Mueller? Mueller. Mueller. Eric Mueller. Um, let me go back to my cheat sheet. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's incredibly distinguished. Um, but he uh, is a lawyer um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and is um, the – was this as a student, the current topics editor, or is that currently? That, that was as a as a student, yeah. yes. Yeah, that was long ago. Yeah, okay. uh, uh, studied at Yale. He also clerked for U.S. District Judge Judge H. Lee Sorokin in Newark, New Jersey, 1970, 1987 to 1988. He practiced law with a private firm in Manhattan, joined the U.S. State's Attorney's Office in Newark. Wow. <laughs> that must have been interesting. Um, also served as an assistant U.S. attorney in the Criminal Appeals Division from 1990 to 1994. He's um, adjunct, taught as an adjunct at Seton Hall Law School, uh, also taught at University of Wyoming Law School, um, joined the UNC faculty in 1998, a widely published um, his book, Free to Die for Their Country, the Story of the Japanese-American Draft Resistors of World War II, was published in 2001 and was named one of the Washington Post book world's top nonfiction titles of 2001. Um, his, he has a second book, American Inquisition, The Hunt for Japanese American Disloyalty in World War II, was also was published just in 2007. He's currently the Associate Dean for Faculty Development at UNC Chapel Hill. It would be interesting to maybe have you reflect a little on the comparison or the allusion Lisa made to the Japanese internment, given your, given your expertise. And then um, Jennifer Rudinger, Rudinger, is that the Rudinger. Rud Rudinger, sorry, my pronunciation's okay. way off. Um, is here also. She is a Duke grad, woohoo! Um, uh, but received her law degree from Ohio State. Uh, she was a U ACLU volunteer. That proves that some of them make good. Um, she uh, uh, worked for the Ohio chapter of NOW. Uh, she's clerked for an, an attorney who handles employment discrimination and civil rights cases. 
She served uh, as uh, executive director of the Alaska Civil Liberties Union. Was that while Palin was mayor or? Mayor. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> so she can tell us about that. We didn't hang out or anything. Oh, good. <laughs> you, can, you, uh, can, can you skin a moose? I'm not good moose? enough with rifles. Yeah. <laughs> so. um, and she's, as she says in her bio, uh, she's since uh, returned to North Carolina and is now the executive director of the ACLU of North Carolina and is happy to be back. Um, and uh, finally, uh, Allison Kaysen, who is a member of North Carolina Stop Torture Now, she's handled all the food for today, so kudos to Allison. We are very appreciative. Um, and she's going to talk um, as someone who lives in Johnson County and who has come literally face to face with some of the employees of uh, aero contractors who have run these rendition flights. Uh, so I think her perspective will be especially interesting. Um, just a quick note, uh, Josh has the parking vouchers, so if you need parking vouchers, <laughs> talk to Josh. I think we have enough to give people however many they need. Um, so, uh, and then uh, when we finish the round table, we will have a reception. So please, if you have the time, stay and just our opportunity to chat more informally. So, uh, and that will be, I don't know, what do you want to call it? What time do you want to stop? Say 545? 5, 540. <laughs> Okay, we'll take 440. <laughs> Done. Um, I think uh, I, I just wanted to make a couple of quick comments. I think this day has been extraordinarily rich, extraordinarily um, interesting, uh, surprising, daunting. Um, mm -hmm. But I think in the end, I feel positive, and I feel like this is something that can be done. It's going to take a lot of work, and I think I really appreciated um, Cynthia's, well, Cynthia's realism and Julia's optimism. Um, one of the, when we were talking about the uh, title for this conference, um, we should have called it Weaving a Web, you know? I'm just like kicking myself for not calling it Weaving a Web, so sorry, Kevin. Um, uh, the fact is, is that, and I make this stuff up, so I just say I write fiction too, so I made up this idea of the law as, as not just this uniform, you know, like big thing that all happens at one place in one time. And I kind of made up this idea that the law actually changes and moves it at, in different ways at different times, at different speeds. And I actually found out that there's a word for this, <laughs> or a, 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 a phrase for this. It's called proactive complementarity. When <laughs> so I was like, wow, <laughs> I'm a law scholar. Um, <laughs> but the, but the, just the idea that that uh, you know, there is no uniform monolithic law out there. The law is how we fight it, what we make of it, how we interpret it, how we write it. And the way I teach my human rights courses, I always start by saying, you know, human rights is a fiction, and that is a good thing. That means that we get to make this stuff up as we go. Um, and that's kind of what we're doing here. We're making it up as we go. Um, but with a lot of expertise and a lot of experience to reflect off of, but a great charge, and I think, you know, I, I'm sure m many of you were also moved by both Bisher's uh, words to us and Stephen's really interesting explanation of why people choose not to care, why people choose not to engage. And um, I think these are things which are both heartening in the sense of Bisher's incredible and just miraculous optimism and sense of humor. I mean, I don't know if anyone else was struck by that, just a sense of humor yeah. in, in the midst of great pain and great suffering. Um, but also the realization that this is not about pointing fingers uh, as much as it is about finding a common thread of humanity with people who we may not think we're going to agree with right now, but who we are going to have to reach out to and we should be reaching out to. Um, and I think that we can find humanity in all sorts of unexpected places and use that as inspiration to build what will be a difficult uh, process here. So those are just my, my words to begin. So Sarah, why don't you take it over from here. And, and uh, uh, Christina's gonna have the mic um, for our discussions. Again, it's not, uh, it's because otherwise the, um, the comments won't be recorded and we really wanna record the entirety of the proceedings. So let me hand it over to Sarah. Is this mic what I should be talking yeah, about? Yeah, but bring it closer to your mouth. I uh, find it remarkably ironic that we've been, from last night on, we've been talking about the importance of looking backward, and they put a historian first in this panel for looking forward. 
We're not particularly good at looking forward. We tend to look backwards, and we're not very good at, prof at giving practical advice. Um, when Deborah Weissman invited me to participate in the roundtable, I was flattered and grateful and said, you know I don't know anything about torture, right? Um, and she said, well, come anyway. Um, so I've been listening all day. I have enormous respect for those of you who are doing this work and talking about this work. Um, I am moved um, by your efforts. I am distraught that despite your efforts, uh, torture continues. Um, what historians can actually do is pull back and look at things from a different perspective, and, and that's what I want to do in, in my five minutes. Um, clearly, we now know a lot about torture, about who the perpetrators are, who the victims are, who the orders are given, who gives the orders, um, who is piloting the planes, the networks um, of, of transportation. Um, we know so much that it's numbing. And still, despite all of our work, it seems that there isn't an outcry. Um, and that's, that's the thing that, that I think is important going forward, <laughs> from a historian's point of view. Accountability presumes a constituency. It presumes people who agree with us that torture is so abhorrent that we need to hold perpetrators accountable. And I think that the big question in this society, uh, I've lived uh, with a man for years now who keeps saying when I was in the army, this stuff was unacceptable. We never even talked about it. All of a sudden, talking about torture and whether torture is acceptable in these conditions and not in those conditions um, is really quite remarkable. From the early French Revolutionary period on, people have known that torture is unacceptable. And I think that to c we, what we need to concentrate on, having documented the, um, the crime, is creating a constituency that will hold people accountable. Um, I think that what, what I see happening among my students and the people that I talk with is that there seem to be two different things, torture and fear. And fear is so pre prevalent in my society right now and among my students that fear trumps everything else. Um, because the context isn't neutral. It's not like these things are evenly balanced. And if, and if we just um, emphasize the torture a little bit more, people will pay attention because the fear keeps getting trumped up. As a historian, though, what I want to suggest is that the fear isn't neutral. The fear is based on a context. The fear is being inculcated on purpose. Steve Saltz talked about how death anxiety leads to a strengthening of, a strengthening of core values. And what I want to suggest is that core values are not necessarily inevitable, right? There are lots of different core values, and some become predominant and others don't. I think it's historically contingent which core values we're going to emphasize right now. Lynn Hunt recently wrote a book, she's a historian, um, called Inventing Human Rights. And what she talks about is that human rights were an invented notion which was responsive to and encouraged fiction. It, it was an imaginary empathy. It was a way for people to connect with people they had never met. It's like the equivalent to Benedict Anderson's imagined communities. This is imagined empathies. It was fiction that allowed people to think that other people might think the way they do. It was fiction and it was living, thinking about others in a universal sense, that people are similar to us. They have the same needs that we do. They love their children the way we do. Um, even Arabs, my students would say, even Arabs <laughs> love their children. Um, that's the very basic level at which torture discourse, I think, needs to revert. What people did to, def to create human rights was define humanity as similar. And it's this place, the United States, where that happens first. So when we talk about reverting to core values, why isn't there a constituency that's talking about that? Universal human rights. When I ask my students, I do a lot of stuff about nationalism. What makes America? Is it the language or the place? Or, invariably, it's the documents. 
you know, warms a historian's heart. It's the documents. It's the Declaration of Independence. It's all men were created evil, e e evil, <laughs> equal. It's the Constitution. It's the things. It's those things that make us human. Those universal notions. Somehow, after the the Twin Towers came down. And I thought Americans were finally going to understand what it meant to have death rained on us from the skies. The discourse was shifted. And we let that happen. But I think that in order to make, to create the constituency the way you all did in Greensboro, you need to retake the discourse. You need to talk about, we need to talk about, to reintroduce a different set of responses to that, um, the fear of death that, uh, that, that seems to be so ubiquitous. I think the bigger context has to do not only um, with this fear of death, but I think it also, re it's very difficult to be articulate when you've only had a few minutes to think. But Scott Horton talked last night about a Guantanamo complex. And the Guantanamo complex is the direct result of the fear. Um, and the fear is what's going to keep people from creating a constituency against torture. Because they think of people like the people that I work around and write about as inherently dangerous. And therefore, they need to be neutralized. That fear is being really um, supported by certain people and for certain reasons. Why is it? Was it the death anxiety that kept our governor our local st and state officials and our president from, from stopping those aero uh, flights? It wasn't. There's a, certain, um, there's a certain political cachet to buying into and promoting the fear. Why isn't Guantanamo closed? For a variety of reasons, one of which is the accusation of not being manly enough and not be being hard on terror enough. Um, the fear gets votes. And we need to somehow change that discourse so that it's not fear anymore that's getting support, but the universal things that Americans have always claimed to be supporting and arguably have from time to time. When we talk about the war on terror, it's important to recognize that terror is something that has existed for many thousands of years, and it was even named in the French Revolution. That's where terrorism gets its name, right? From the terror and Robespierre and stuff like that. I'm being a historian. It's about instilling fear. That's what defines it. Can we retake this discourse by talking about who the terror creators are? Who's creating fear in our midst right now, and why are they doing it? People are creating terror by shooting people. They're also creating terror by making it so that we're all afraid to fly, so that we're afraid to speak up, so that we're afraid to talk about um, uh, torture. Um, so what I want to talk about, what I want us all collectively to talk about, is an internal war on terrorism and redefine the war on terror as uh, to opposition to those issues that are most devastating to our society directly and indirectly, the most damaging, um, uh, which is the constant fear that keeps us from behaving in the way that we all expect each other to behave. I think that she's about to tell me um, that it's time <laughs> to quit. What I wanted to suggest is that part of creating accountability is creating a climate where we can make common cause against those who keep us fearful, those who technically are terrorists. And what I, what I want to ask you for advice on um, is how we do that, how we go from accepting the notion that there are three dozen people in North Carolina or 300 people in North Carolina that are opposed to torture. We've documented that it's going on. We're horrified by it. In the midst of an entire country that sees torture as a legitimate thing to do under certain circumstances, according to television shows. Under these circumstances, it's OK. Under these circumstances, it's OK. That comes from fear. And I don't know that we're going to be successful in creating a culture of accountability without creating a constituency first. Well, thanks very much. I wanted to, um, like everyone else, I wanted to express my appreciation for being invited to be part of this day today. It's really been, uh, I wasn't able to attend yesterday evening's events, but today really has been quite something, an eye-opener. I learned a tremendous amount. 
Um, and I wanted to thank the organizers uh, of, the, uh, of the event. I wanted to thank Robin for that very nice introduction. Little shout out to my extremely wonderful colleague, Deborah Weissman, and mm -hmm. her incredible energy and passion for uh, all manners of justice issues. And I have to also say fantastic job to the three UNC law mm -hmm. students yeah. who spoke earlier today who just Thank blew you. us away. Um, my area of, uh, of research and writing is the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. Um, so I come here similarly encumbered in a certain way as a person whose interests are primary histor primarily historical. Um, but what I thought I could do in just a, a really just literally a couple of minutes um, is to point out a few points of similarity between the situation in which this movement seems to find itself and the situation uh, in which Japanese Americans found themselves as they um, charted the course towards their own redress and apology and uh, ultimately reparations payments. Um, and I, I thought that uh, it was, it's interesting to think about, um, to think about, um, well, first of all, the fact, I mean, I, you know, I'm struck by the fact that it was extraordinarily difficult for the Japanese American community to um, uh, work this issue through a full 40 plus years after the events in question, right? E even, as, even as late as the early 1980s, it was deeply, deeply controversial and far from a sure thing that uh, a majority of members of the House and Senate of the United States would, um, would uh, sign on to even a tepidly worded apology of any kind, let alone reparations payments. And there are still those out there, unfortunately, revisionists who continue to defend uh, those uh, uh, excesses, those civil, li uh, civil liberties violations of World War II. So it's an enormous task. Um, it's an especially an enormous task so close to the moment. We might feel that we're already go a good several years past, you know, these flights, uh, the, the ones that were documented this morning coming in and out of the state, but um, the, the Japanese exper ex American experience suggests to me that this is going to be a long haul. <laughs> Um, and that the idea of trying to bring accountability is a process that needs to be seen in terms of decades sometimes rather than in terms of uh, weeks or, 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 or months or even just a few years. Um, I wanted to talk just for a second about the way in which the Japanese American redress movement succeeded within the Japanese American community and then a little bit about the way that the, Jap the, w the, way that the redress movement ultimately really succeeded by reaching outside the Japanese American community. Um, because I think that there are some important issues and um, some important parallels. Um, one of the questions that has been going through my mind over and over again since the first thing this morning is the question of, you know, and we've been asked to, to, to help brainstorm a little bit what a commission might look like or what might it do. What is the focus? What is it that's being sought? What's being asked for? Um, because we have heard both about the inv specifically about North Carolina, about the involvement of businesses, individuals within the state of North Carolina and the either open or perhaps hidden cooperation of North Carolina elected officials in flights. But then we've also heard a great deal about the much larger um, network web uh, of which this is just one part. Well, it seems to me that uh, any organization that is trying to bite off and chew the task of of uh, inquiry and investigation and ultimately redress needs to decide what its focus is. Um, uh, that was a decision that Japanese American, the Japanese American community needed to make and it was a quite painful process for them. Uh, um, so that's, that, that's, that's, that's one question. There's also this question about what is being sought. Or is, is what is being sought an investigation or is what is being sought a condemnation or a judgment? Uh, and of course, it was very strongly the view of the Japanese American community, particularly by the 1970s, that everybody knew what happened and everybody knew that it was wrong. And it was simply a question of getting the power structure to admit that. However, that wasn't the route that the Japanese American community ultimately took because uh, th they realized that while they may have known and been quite persuaded about what happened and its wrongfulness, that that was not generally known and not generally shared, and that they were much likelier to succeed in getting an apology, getting redress, getting reparations, if there was a nationally commissioned process of investigation undertaken. And that was deeply angering to many in the Japanese American community who felt that it was a sellout 
why should we investigate this? We know what happened to us, and we know how wrong it was. But the judgment that was made was that an inv a strategy of investigation as a preliminary or a precursor to judgment was a, a necessary strategy. And, you know, uh, it seems to have been successful. However, it was deeply controversial and quite difficult for the community to accept the necessity of supposedly neutrally investigating something that already seemed quite wrong. There is also the same discussion about what's the best venue, the courts versus the legislative process. This is something that was discussed a number of times today. And, um, uh, you know, uh, it turns out that for Japanese Americans, both of the, it, as was said earlier, both of those needed to be pursued. And they actually ended up reinforcing each other mutually. Um, not so much, th there was an, uh, there was a full out loss, uh, class action lawsuit brought for out and out redress, for, for, for uh, in a sense, a kind of constitutional tort action brought against the government on behalf of Japanese Americans that, that epically failed, as my teenage children would say. Um, <laughs> However, there was a different set of lawsuits that was brought that was challenging some of the convictions that had been brought uh, uh, or obtained against Japanese Americans for resisting incarceration. And the process of discovery in those lawsuits ended up providing documents and information that was very helpful to the legislative process of investigation and ultimately condemnation of those events. So I think that it's important to think um, as, 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 as the, the political and judicial processes as um, cooperative with one another rather than rival methods to the same outcome. Um, the last thing I want to say is uh, something about outside the community. Because ultimately the reason that the Jap I think the reason the Japanese Americans um, effort succeeded was only partly because of the, um, the community's own accomplishment in quelling its internal debates and its internal disagreements and speaking with essentially one voice. It's also that they were very effective in reaching out and finding friends outside their community, including friends from across the aisle. And this was crucially, crucially important. A huge supporter of redress was Alan Simpson, the Republican whip, the senator from Wyoming, quite a conservative fellow. But he had an old friend from his childhood named Norman Mineta, mm -hmm. who was a congressman at that time, went on to become a cabinet secretary, Alan Simpson and Norman Mineta met each other as Boy Scouts when Norman Mineta was incarcerated at the Heart Mountain Relocation Center as a Japanese American. They were in a Boy Scout jamboree together as 12-year-olds. And they sustained their friendships through the years, and that is what enabled Alan Simpson to be brought on board and to become a very articulate supporter. Somewhat more crassly, Ted Stevens of Alaska was brought on board the redress effort by, agree by the agreement to include an investigation into the treatment of Aleutian Islanders in the commission that was looking at the treatment of Japanese Americans. It was essentially a political deal, but it got Ted Stevens on board and it got his support. So I would encourage, though I can't be there for the discussion tomorrow, I would encourage some brainstorming about who some friends might be that you might not otherwise think are friends uh, and how best to reach out to them in a way that's embracing um, and that can appeal to um, some commonality uh, of experience that they might have. It's really a tragedy, I think, uh, in many ways, that John McCain has ended up going in the direction that he went, because it seems to me that on this issue he might, in an alternative universe, have been, uh, have been quite a good friend of, of this movement because of his own life experiences. Sure. Um. Well, I would just echo uh, what Sarah and Eric have said, that the, the way this panel, the whole day has been organized is extraordinary, and every panel has built on the previous panel, um, all culminating in now where we get to share views and hear from each other and interact. So uh, it's just, it's an extraordinary experience to be here, and I just want to shout out also to all the people who organized this. Um, as I was thinking about these questions, I mean, <laughs> like Sarah, I said to Deborah Weissman, uh, I, she, the questions are so heady. I said, I don't know the answers to those questions, but I'd love to be part of the discussion. Um, so I'm happy to be here, but I'm not going to answer the five questions for us. I do have a couple of thoughts, though, just to throw into the mix as we all discuss these questions. Um, based on my 
limited experience, which most relevant to this is the experience I had in Alaska working on the Patriot Act and building opposition to the Patriot Act in a heavily military, heavily conservative, ultra-conservative state. Um, what was essential, what, what happened, the outcome that we achieved in Alaska was that Alaska very early on in, in 2003, in 2003, the state legislature passed a resolution by a combined vote in both houses of 56 to 1, because there always has to be one, um, in favor of calling on Congress to amend the Patriot Act or repeal it, complaining about it, um, calling on our government to always respect habeas corpus, and insisting that in the state of Alaska, racial profiling would never be a tool that would be used to fight against terrorism and to implement the Patriot Act. This was, again, one of the most conservative states in the country, a very military state. And when that state, which was only, Hawaii was first and, and Alaska was second in terms of statewide resolutions to call on Congress to fix or repeal the Patriot Act, uh, when Alaska did that, it changed the debate nationwide. It changed the debate. No longer could p people legitimately claim this was some lefty issue. Um, this, is, this is just a bunch of anti-American peaceniks or what have you. This was amazing to be a part of. And it was not easy, but it also wasn't as hard as I would have expected. I certainly didn't expect 56 to 1. And, and we were just so excited about that. Um, a couple things that we did to accomplish that were understand the culture of the state and get voices to speak publicly and in the media who would resonate with the majority of the state and particularly the majority of people in power in the state to accomplish that legislative outcome. And sometimes that meant, for one thing, I, the ACLU, never spoke publicly on the pending resolution until it passed. <laughs> then I'm on NPR and, you know, <laughs> woohoo, CNN, but not until it passed. And I had to beg and plead with people who were in our coalition for a long time building up to this legislative push, who earned the right to speak out publicly and, f and deeply wanted to. And I begged and pleaded, and they, to their credit, they also refrained from commenting publicly because we knew that the most persuasive voices would be conservative voices in that particular context in that state. Also librarians on that particular issue. And librarians are not perceived as being partisan, political, you know. What librarians brought to that discussion besides the perception of neutrality was that when they spoke, they helped regular people understand how Section 215 of the Patriot Act affected them. And um, one of the challenges, I think, in, in building communication strategies around issues that we work on is getting people to see how these issues affect them. Um, it's, it's a constant challenge in everything the ACLU does. Constitutional rights, human rights, are so often seen as a some <coughs> ivory or gothic, in this case, tower discussion, something that is intellectually interesting and, but not as important as jobs or healthcare or the economy, they, not as real in people's everyday lives. And so it's constantly a challenge to get people to see how it matters to them, to their children, um, to their families, what, what we do in human rights issues. Um, and so I think as I've thought about these questions and as I've, I've listened to these discussions, for one thing, I've, I've never been involved in a 
truth commission or, or any kind of citizens accountability commission type process, I could probably spend all day picking the brains of Cynthia and Julia and, <laughs> and, um, and, and trying to get a sense of what that's like. I think that is really fascinating. And Lisa, um, I think as we go forward that, that I, my short answer to should we do a citizen review process is yes. We've tried legislation. Um, we, we tried uh, tackling it with our voices, with our group. And, and we really got farther, I'm pretty cynical, so we got farther than I thought we would. I was extremely impressed with that. Um, and getting that study commission and getting that report, that is huge. And that is going to be useful going forward because that is just another um, legitimate you know, uh, uh, process that has taken place to add credibility to, and certainly acknowledging the need um, for creating these new types of statutes. But as if what we found out in the legislative process was, I'm sure you'll be shocked, that, that the Democrats who currently hold power are not especially courageous. <laughs> and, I, I'm, I, and there's no Santa Claus either. Um, <laughs> I know, right, exactly. Yeah, no, Easter Bunny, that's in the Bible. Um, but I, I just. I think what it's going to take, and we've had legislators tell us this on so many issues we work on, whether it's immigration or uh, what any issue, and certainly it'll be true of this one, is that there's a few courageous people there, but there aren't enough of them. And they have to, it won't be altruism that convinces them. It won't be a sense of a higher purpose. It will be real political concerns, a sense that their constituency cares, a sense that they will be held accountable for not um, proceeding with some type of accountability process and implementing new statutes. So I would say as we go forward, um, the credibility of this commission is going to be key. And in order to achieve that, we will want to have a statewide presence urban, rural, west, east, middle. Um, we want to have a, a large network of people involved. And when it comes to involving the military, which several people have talked about, one message that, that we need to find a voice um, to express, because I don't know that it would come well from, certainly not from me, is the message that, that torture ex makes, our military is very vulnerable to being tortured, and if we torture, um, as Julia talked about, the moral authority of this country to insist that our own soldiers not be tortured is diminished. Um, and so if we, get, if we could get military families to speak up and say, my brother, my husband, is, my son is abroad, I don't want him or I don't want my daughter who's abroad tortured, um, and therefore I oppose our government doing, and by the way, it doesn't work, get those voices to um, speak out. And it may be that we have to do a little focus group or polling to develop messages because there are, we need to find people who don't think like us, and that means we don't already know how they think. And we need to figure out a way to bring them into the discussion and to get them to then communicate to other people who think like them. Um, and also faith-based groups expanding that um, community. In North Carolina, military and religion, I think, are two big communities that if we don't get them on board in a major way early on, uh, it, we just won't have the credibility we need to ultimately achieve the outcomes we hope to achieve. So um, I, will, I will stop at that, but I look forward to continuing in that process. So I'm going to focus a little bit on Johnston County because that's what I know uh, very intimately. <clears throat> I moved there 24 years ago with my family. When we moved there from Chapel Hill, we were warned that Johnston County had at one time sported a sign that said, Welcome to KKK Country. Yep. Well, I'm pleased to announce that that billboard is no longer there, but we're sporting two new billboards with uh, George Bush kind of doing this, and it says, miss me yet. So those are sort of popping up um, all Where's over our county. On 70? <laughs> on 70, yes, two places on 70. 
So, so for 19 years, I'm part of this community, and I don't know anybody, so, you know, we get involved in our church and our school and the PTA, and we become really sort of enmeshed in society in Johnston County, or not society, but the, our children's world. So when, in 2005, we got a notice that the folks from St. Louis were coming and they were going to tell us what was going on out at the airport, we'd heard that the CIA was out at the airport. It was sort of a well-kept secret that everybody knew, but nobody knew what they did out there. So I went to that meeting to sort of see what was going on and was shocked when I saw the names of the people involved because... These were the pillars of our community. Mm -hmm. These were lawyers and doctors and county commissioners. These were not sort of abstract people, but people that we'd seen on the soccer field, people that we'd been to church with. Um, and in the case of two of Arrow's three directors, I had been their personal baker and gingerbread house maker. So, it's, it's a shock to see these names. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, they're very well enmeshed in society. So when speaking out against them, we're not speaking out against some abstract person, but we're speaking out against our neighbor. But one of the good things about being what Walt and I called ourselves sleeper cells for 19 years <laughs> is that we weren't considered wacko completely. I mean, they kind of knew we were leftists, but, you know, we'd been the PTA president and the soccer coach, so they couldn't really completely dish us. So I want you to know that these folks are not considered horrible people, but really pillars of our community. Um, and so... Then I learned about the Freedom of Information Act and got involved with Stop Torture Now, and we started looking at that this was a county-owned airport. And at first, I kept thinking that the county was subsidizing aero contractors. So we called the county and asked for uh, all the leases of all the hangars, uh, which is, that's just really powerful to be able to call up and say, hey, you know, this is public information. I want all the leases. So we've got stacks of leases. <laughs> And in combing through those leases, what we learned is that most hangers rent for around $400 to $1,500 a month. Guess what Aero Contractors pays the Johnston County Airport? $18,000 a month. So, so the county's not subsidizing Aero. Aero's subsidizing the county. Big shift there for me. Big shift. So... <clears throat> There's another uh, story that Josh asked me to tell. We've been going to the county commissioners. I mean, you saw, we've been doing a lot of stuff, but um, Chuck and I have been going to the county commissioners for over a year now. One day at work, I'm, I pull up my Yahoo, and I see this story about how there is this hardened Al-Qaeda criminal, and I can't remember his name, that had been tortured and they weren't able to get any information from this fellow at all. And then somebody discovered that he was diabetic. And so they got him sugar-free cookies. And all of a sudden this fellow started talking and they were able to get information from him once they gave him cookies. Mm -hmm. So, oh, that's great, you know, I'm a baker. So I uh, <laughs> made copies of that article and I baked cookies for the county commissioners. And so when we handed them the article saying how cookies had really sort of softened a hardened criminal, my plea to the county commissioners was, Certainly, if cookies can soften a hardened Al-Qaeda criminal, it can open your hearts just a little bit. And then we gave them the homemade cookies. Of course, you know, there's no reaction from them at all. And then I, d I do want to say that progress has been made in Johnston County. We have at least five Johnstonians in the crowd right now. So, yay. yay. <laughs> oh. We've been doing a lot of petition drives, asking folks to sign a petition that w is calling on the governor and the county commissioners to investigate aero contractors. We have over 200 signs signed on the petition. What we found is if we go closer to Raleigh, we get a better response. Then when we go closer to the heart of Smithfield, we don't get such a great response. Um, we have 
we have some real concrete examples of individuals changing their minds. And I'll tell you another quick story. We were having a, um, a rally, a peace rally, and my job was to sort of work with the local uh, town manager and getting all the permits and the police and all that. And well, the man that I needed the permits from, I actually had been a Tiger Scout leader with 20 some years ago. So I went in and asked him and he closed the door and he said, I don't understand why you're doing this. And I know that he's a faith-based person because his son was doing a walk across South America at the time. So I said, Paul, I come from this from a faith-based place. And we had this sort of little push and shove back and forth. And finally, out of frustration, I finally said, you know, I think if Jesus were to come down here right now and talk to the two of us, he's going to side with me. I just <laughs> well, he got mad at that, and I ended up crying and leaving, and it was bad. And then a few weeks later, my son was having his Eagle Scout ceremony, and Paul's son was in the ceremony. And I, of course, I wanted it to be, to be a happy time, so I didn't invite him, Paul. Uh, he came anyway. And immediately upon the end of the ceremony, he came up to Walt and I, and he said, you know what? I was wrong, and you were right. And you have to keep doing what you're doing. You have to keep talking to people. So that's there's progress. It's small. It's one person at a time. The Johnston County Democratic Party is a co-sponsor of this event. I think that's huge. Uh, Lamar Armstrong is a member of the Democratic Party. He is ERA's uh, legal counsel and secretary. So, you know, they couldn't be here today, but they support us. Um, the, the candidate for sheriff for Johnston County has said that he would like to see an investigation of aero contractors, so we're, we're making small, small progress. And then I just wanted one more little thing to say is, do y'all remember when last July there were homegrown terrorists from Johnston County that were arrested? Well, they were our backdoor neighbors for a few years before all of that happened, and they were a American Muslim family um, with five children and they were very nice people. Well, evidently, the father and two sons were arrested on, um, I read the indictments, conspiracy to commit <coughs> crimes outside the United States. So they, you know, there's a lot of evidence against them, but in the indictment, when, when I read that, to me it said, wow, here is a Johnston County person that is being arrested Here's the indictment that says conspiracy to commit crimes outside the United States. That's exciting. Why aren't we arresting the principals at Aero Contractors? So that's all. Thank you. So now I just invite comments, questions, interventions from, from you all. Nonviolent. <laughs> it's on the bottom, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Uh, I think the historical aspect of it is quite important. Uh, I've studied history as well in some depth. Uh, I'd be a little bit concerned about we'll say, the idea of just looking forward. I think it's hugely important to look forward and to look back. So we need eyes in the front of our head and eyes in the back of our head. And having the historical perspective on it is absolutely vital. Um, so um, the uh, issue also, I think, of um, what's happening here in North Carolina is very important. But the looking at the larger international solidarity uh, and uh, possibly even looking at the possibility of um, establishing an international torture truth commission of some sort. Uh, clearly, having one local is important, but having a broader network or um, web, uh, sp spider's web uh, of um, accountability internationally and uh, getting together possibly um, some highly competent and respected legal and international relations people to get involved with this International Truth Commission, I think, would be very important. Uh, 
Along with Allison, I've been the most regular attender at the Johnston County Commission meetings over the last 14 months. I don't live in Johnston County. I live in Cumberland County right next door to Fort Bragg. And in both situations, I've become very much aware of the very, very deep cultural gaps between Duke, the Triangle, and shall we say, Johnston County. Um, I, as I have often said to my, my own constituents for the peace project that I direct, the distance from Durham to Fayetteville is much, much farther than the distance from Fayetteville to Durham. Mm -hmm. Same goes for Chapel Hill and Raleigh and other places like that. And it's, there's also a big, a big distance, cultural distance, between here and Johnston County. And I'm only beginning, after 14 months or so, Allison being a real long-time resident is far advanced in this respect, but we're establishing a relationship with these commissioners. It's really getting kind of interesting. They, at the beginning, they have, we do this, we go visit them, they have a public comment period, and so we take advantage of that. And we've tried to be very polite. Uh, I think we've pretty well succeeded. <laughs> so we haven't given them occasion to say we're obnoxious outsiders. Obnoxious, maybe, in some certain ways, but not in our manner of presentation. And we've had some long, significant engagements with them. With, and, but also, when we started out, the public comment period was at the beginning of their meetings. But after several months, the chairman changed it to the end, I guess trying to discourage us. So we've been, I've been sitting through their meetings and learning about community development in Johnston County and also watching them in action. They're all Republicans. They're the ones who are up for election this year are running unopposed. But now I know one of them wasn't there last Monday night. He was having heart stuff. Another one, uh, several months ago, his wife died. And the deputy chair, I think she's got some beginning Parkinson's. And one of them is a retired master sergeant. And another one's got a son in Afghanistan. Now we've learned all of this, and this has become part of our discourse with them. I'm not exactly sure where this is going, but month after month after month, we go back. It's gotten to be a thing now where we sort of bring them, a prepare an update. Uh, yeah, this past month, there was an investigation going in Lithuania and an investigation going in Spain and an investigation going in Poland. How about an investigation in Johnston County? We keep repeating that. Uh, <coughs> building these types of connections is really important, and I, I'd stress it also in terms of the military around Fort Bragg, which I think has been woefully neglected in this discussion so far. So anyway, that's a long comment, but I felt I wanted to say it. Thank you all. Your comments were just so helpful in pulling us together at the end of the, this long and very good day. Um, one of the things that strikes me, and I've been worried about this, um, from the very beginning when we began to talk about a commission is what everyone I think has touched on and that is the idea that um, there is fear and that we have to learn how to talk to people. Um, and we have to learn, as, as Sarah put it, to, to build constituencies. But I want to inject a, a little bit of optimism about that, uh, specifically about North Carolina. And I don't think I'm being a Pollyanna. Um, first is to say I think that we are often, I think, operating under some misunderstanding about who we are. And I don't mean people in this room, I mean people in all communities all across the state, all county. Uh, I don't know why that is. I could blame it on the media. Um, we hear the bad news, we don't hear the good news. Um, the other thing I would say is that when I first came to North Carolina some 14, 15 years ago, before I was teaching at the law school, I was the director of legal services of North Carolina and we were in 83 of 100 counties, and I had to get to know my, my, my programs all over the state. And everywhere I went, I was struck by pockets of progressivism mm -hmm. and fair-minded people and people who cared about feeding their neighbors and housing and clothing their neighbors. So we do have to build a constituency, and that's going to be our, our biggest job. And I don't mean to minimize it, but I also think that we have to give some credit where credit is due uh, to the people of the state. It's 
not, they're not just the people in this room. People are busy feeding their families, clothing their families, worried about their plants closing and, and leaving, and, and everything that we know we're involved with besides extraordinary rendition and torture. So just to keep that in mind, because I know oftentimes we forget that, and we think we're much more sort of marginalized than we are. Um, th this, uh, this question actually arises out of a number of the presenters from Stephen, Cynthia, I think she's just left, and just the building a constituency. Mm -hmm. And based on all these other commissions of inquiry that um, we've drawn on today for experience, um, the one thing that would be fundamentally different about a commission of inquiry here is the victims aren't here. Yeah. You know, they're over there. And that to me would be a big problem in building that constituency and I'm wondering if, if, if you guys have, have any sort of ideas as to how you would um, adapt or develop a commission um, given the fact that most of the victims, if not all of the victims, will never be able to come here to North Carolina. I, I agree. I think that is one of the biggest challenges that we will face and that's why I think getting the families of the men and women who are overseas who are vulnerable, or even at this point, even civilians who go hiking are you know, being picked up um, by governments that we need to retain the moral authority to convince them to honor treaties, so we need to honor the treaties ourselves. And that way, it isn't just about the other, it's about us. I think that's one way to go at it. And then there's also the the faith-based, values-based way to go at it. But it is a huge challenge. Um, not only are the victims not here, but it's difficult to even bring them here um, once they have been released, as we just saw. So. I have a few comments, too. Uh, that, it, uh, I think that's a really good comment. Um, and, a, and, a, and, a, uh, and it is a real obstacle, though I would draw on history. <laughs> to say that, um, and maybe Chuck could, uh, Chuck also may know some more about this, but um, the British movement and the slave trade had the same problem. The victims weren't in the UK. They were slaves in the Caribbean, in the United States, what have you. Um, and there were, a, you know, there were a few in England, but uh, it was a movement based on the building of a kind of sympathy and empathy that didn't depend on the person being one of us. You know, it, it, it depended on, you know, uh, th there, Adam Hochschild has written a great book called uh, Bury the Chains, which is all about the slave trade movement, the movement to end the slave trade. And um, the, and I think that they used, they really pioneered all of these techniques, investigations, lobbying, you know, all, everything that we do now in human rights, they did. And they, and they logos, the whole bit. Um, but they managed to build that empathy based on the missing victim. But one of the things they did, and uh, connecting to what Jennifer just said, is they also found these unusual alliances. Mm -hmm. And one of the most effective alliances they made was with the families of British sailors. Because the sailors, per capita, had a higher mortality rate than the slaves. <coughs> because the slaves were valuable cargo. Right, so there was a incentive to keep slaves alive. No, she's going to look at me like that because this is like one of my lectures in my class. <laughs> she's looking at me. She said, "I heard this before." <laughs> um, but um, uh, so because the, the the sailors weren't valuable, right? You know, because they they were all what is the word uh, press gang? Yeah, because you know every time the British Navy needed sailors, they would just go to the nearest town and round them up. You know, mm -hmm. and they died because of disease, they were whipped to death, they were keel hauled, and so they died in great, greater numbers per capita than the slaves themselves. So the families became very willing allies in this movement and the slave trade. So I think that, and that goes to your point about military families too. It's like they get it in a way I think that, that and I, you know, also linking to Deborah's point, maybe in a way we don't appreciate enough, but, um, and, and that human connection, who was talking about that today? Um, uh, that we can't diminish. Um, I think
think it was you, Stephen, about the, the just the connection that one person makes to another, and it's so unknowable in the end what that's going to be. But anyway, that's just a historical comment. Yeah, because it's just from my experience, you know, when you I've met, I've met mm -hmm. guys mm -hmm. being represented apart from two who are in prison, and, um, you know, just my experience is so much richer as a consequence of that, and I think mm -hmm. you can really change hearts and minds as you move yourself. Mm -hmm. If you click on the bottom, make sure it just says on. Yeah. Um, so I, I'd like to thank all of the panelists here. I thought their presentations were incredibly thought provoking, and particularly with a view to tomorrow's discussions, mm -hmm. there are many uh, very important strategies that come up. I just wanted to um, raise a, a couple of thoughts that, that perhaps stem from that. And in my background is that I worked for five years on food commissions in Sierra Leone and in Liberia, and I then subsequently got on to investigate system mm -hmm. for the last four and a half years, so I somehow would feel like today is bringing a lot of threads <laughs> together um, in my commission uh, career. But the first thing is that I've, I've noticed now from North Carolina that institutions um, have an enormous presence here, and I think it's you, Jennifer, that men mentioned too, religion and the military. Mm -hmm. And of course, those can appear to be daunting obstacles to accountability, because what can small people do to overcome institutions. But then the um, example given by Eric about friends in unlikely places mm -hmm. based on the commonality of experience uh, brought home another point, which is that institutions are actually collections of individuals at the end of the day. And institutions often don't respond well to appeals to conscience because institutions don't have consciences. But individuals within the institutions do have consciences. And that's why the work that Alison has talked about on a low level, approaching people and appealing to their humanity and their individual consciences is in fact the way forward. And I think that, that offers a great degree of promise. Um, it was actually in the DKE uh, Treatment Act by, uh, put forward by Senator McCain, um, presumably for his political transformation, <laughs> that he raised the point about torture uh, overseas. And he said that the benchmark ought to be if American people would find it uh, intolerable that so much as one service man overseas would be subjected to these, treat to these uh, techniques, then we ought to speak out against those techniques being applied to our people. And that think of, of, of conscience from a Republican senator, after all, offers promise. It mm -hmm. might be that if we can appeal to military families on the basis that we've discussed about the potential reciprocity of treatment that results, then we, we would... Um, have more traction. And that brings me to a further point, which is Stephen mentioned that the victims of extraordinary rendition are not present. But I think that all depends on your concept of victimhood. The men who have been bundled onto the aircraft and rendered to detention in black sites and torture are not here. However, such is the practice of torture and its diminishing effect on our common humanity. Mm -hmm. There are different forms of victims all through Johnson County and all through the state of North Carolina. There may be, for example, Muslim families, and I thought this might have been the point that you were about to make, Alison, who feel that their participation in civic society um, or their American identities or their North Carolina identities have been tainted by the fact that, that residents of their county are identified as having tortured other Muslims overseas. Um, and even then, there might be further and more remote connections between activists and the peace movement, the anti-torture movement, who feel themselves sullied and therefore victimized in a different way by the very notion that their North Carolinian brethren are engaged in this form of activity. And that therefore creates a stand for victims in a North Carolina Food Commission, because each individual voice is just as important uh, in, in that process. Mm -hmm. And then a, a further reflection might be that these persons overseas, like Fisher, could be engaged in different ways, for example, by delegations from North Carolina going to meet them. Mm -hmm. An ideal scenario, perhaps, someone from Aero who ultimately might demonstrate contrition, mm -hmm. being able to meet a victim, and then come back to North Carolina and talk about that experience, <coughs> and therefore convey that to the wider community. And these are things that in, in various contexts where I worked in Sierra Leone, we 
nothing ended up being the most powerful and therefore the most constructive steps in a creating that information process. I want to end with a question in the spirit of Alison. Um, institutions and individuals was, was my key. Looking into aero contractors, um, I sometimes find it indistinguishable from the, the, the institution of the federal government. I always have looked at it and tried to break it down into whatever corporate structure it might have or its individual officers have invariably been thwarted by what appears to be it is an extension of the Central Intelligence Agency. In your experience, do you have any evidence to contradict that, that in fact it is a private company or a collection of North Caledonians who are performing a service? And if so, do you think these are persons who could be approached in an individual capacity in your experience? It, it is a private company and you can go on the North Carolina Secretary of State website and they file a um, report every year and get their latest um, officers and directors. So much like been said earlier in the day that institutions are made up of people, you know, at, at eight o'clock in the morning and at five in the afternoon, if we were to stand out side of aero contractors, we would see a whole line of folks going in and out mm -hmm. that um, we might also see on the soccer field. I mean, our local newspaper editor said that he encountered somebody with an aero contractor's t-shirt on, which um, they sign a, a statement of secrecy. So <laughs> he was really surprised to sort of see that out on the soccer field. <laughs> I often feel like we're at a disadvantage because they know who we are and we don't know who all of them are. Mm -hmm. Certainly 130 people, um, there's a lot of opportunity to engage. Andrew and I were out there yesterday taking pictures and a 60 year old woman came out um, of Aero Contractors and the gate came open so Andrew was taking you know, unobstructed pictures of the hangers and she backed up and engaged us and she asked me what we were doing and I said we were taking pictures and she asked why and I said because we want to. Um, <laughs> and she, she said, well, who are you? And I said, well, we're with Stop Torture Now. Do you know who we are? And she said, we absolutely know who you are <laughs> and we wish you people would get a life. <laughs> so, so, I mean, she looks like a Sunday school teacher. She's six years old, she's in a little business suit. She's had her nails done, her hair done, all that. She's very proper. So I'm like gonna try to appeal to her uh, from a Christian perspective. <coughs> so I say, I'm doing God's work. I'm speaking for the least of these. Um, and her response to me was, well, God knows what we're doing out here. I just wish you people did. And she zoomed off. So, you know, there's opportunity for engagement, but there's a lot of barriers there, even with the, the faith-based community. I don't know if that answered your question, <laughs> Gavin, or not, but. It does, and I think we can engage with more of that question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as, as far as um, engaging with uh, sort of the, across the political gulf we have in our country right now, I think maybe the law and order and the community, sort of a community policing frame might have a lot of potential. I mean, because in engaging with some of the uh, counter protesters in front of Arrow's gate that were for the gathering of eagles and stuff, we had some interesting conversations after a riot was averted. And because um, <laughs> uh, they were glad that the violence was avoided also. And some of the, con one of the conversations where this guy was, you know, you guys don't realize that these are threatening people out there. And these people who are religious often see that they're on God's mission to make this, this uh, uh, world safer and to promote freedom. And so if we, um, you know, when you talk about rend rendition and due process and, I mean, uh, extradition, you know, there's, I think there's a lot of potential with this kind of community policing idea that part of the truth and reconciliation is that uh, that we be uniters and not dividers, that we're, that in the, the passion of, tr of our pain at being attacked, we may have gone to extremes and now is the right moment uh, where for us to, uh, to, to 
work together about how you know we do have a, a great justice system. Not there are other great you know not to be too chauvinistic about it, but you know that America has good ideals of, of, of due process, and we need to uh, work as a community and an international community to, to be leaders in that. And I think if we that could be that's a, a, a frame that could be a lot more appealing to people that uh, we normally think of as, as being uh, irreconcilably uh, different. Is there one? Is there one more question out there? Uh, Stephen had up here. Sorry, this this means the system needs to be rebooted. And I oh, have not the latest <laughs> idea how to do it. Yeah, just you could just. I think we're done with the yeah, table. Yeah, well, I'm known for being a loud mouth. <laughs> that shouldn't be a problem. And then the president figured out who I was and started freaking. But <laughs> so I was, fortunately, my whole talk had been the research talk on just the military. Almost everything had been for hours and hours was quoting all the military people. You know, you know, uh, I, I, I'm blocking it in the uh, in the uh, prosecutor, at, uh, lieutenant colonel at um, oh, Vanderbilt at Guantanamo who wrote an op-ed. Um, I was slow to realize um, the shame that is Guantanamo, and just you know, and you know, it really you could see them really struggling with it. It was a very pro-military audience; about half the people were in the military and reserves, and you know, very right-wing, but not totally. They were much more; they were open and some. But you know, the other thing was I kept on harping on the Golden Rule because it seems to me it was something that can bring us together from many perspectives. One is the military issue about you know, why would we want to do to, do to them what we don't want done to us? Second is the, is the, the religious and the faith community. I mean, I'm, I'm not from that, but I, what I realized is I really did share a set of values with them. And that that's, what, that's where the sharing was. I mean, God, I think they're without faith. But, but <laughs> that I really did. Um, and you are from Boston. I, I'm from Boston. <laughs> well, I'm born, I was the second world series in life, so that's <laughs> Share, we also share a bunch of values. 
And so I think we have to not be afraid and defensive about who we are. I mean, I, I you know, I mean, I, I kind of one of my, my former counterintelligence guy who's who's probably a liberal, but he, but he's staying with his friend who's an extreme right wing guy, and who's like ranting about Obama and this and that. But I just make a joke about well, I'm, I'm, I'm the old anti-war lefty guy, and you know, and so. And that's fine because I'm not, you know, I'm being genuine. And so, I think that we can form relationships with a segment. We have to remember that one of the strongest opponents of this was a segment in the military. Um, that the Jags went to Scott Horton in 2002, um, long before any of us even knew what was happening. Uh, that the interrogators were aghast. I mean, there are so many interrogators who were like, "This is not." This is not the army I I served in, you know. Um, as one great Bennett friend of mine says, I want my white hat back. Um, you know, I thought I was doing an honorable thing, and then I'm in Iraq, and I knew the rules. I knew the Geneva Convention because they didn't tell people what the rules were. The com I mean, the commanders, and this is not what I signed up for. And what I served, sold my life for, and the sense of betrayal, profound betrayal that they feel, mm -hmm. is something that we that we really share there, because they felt that they were doing something honorable. So there is a real faction there who we really can form relationships with, and we shouldn't shy from that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think having said that that would be the last comment, I, I did want to say something real, real short, actually, mm -hmm. which was um, talking with Ed earlier. I think there's potential in an organizing sense to try to get together a, a, a vast group of thinking um, movement for apology and reparation from the United States yeah. to um, sort of like the delegation work done in the Central American Solidarity Movement, where where the people to people connections broke down a lot of that sense of isolation and the ability to demonize the other. Um, and and so our government won't give an apology and our government won't make reparations. So we need to do that. So if we did that as a society here and sent emissaries on a delegation, you know, maybe we could include some military family representatives or some veterans uh, who, who aren't, who are veterans for peace, but also maybe some other more conservative. And I think it shouldn't just be reparations by the United States. Ireland should also be coming reparations. Yeah, and maybe Britain. that could have more of an international yeah, yeah. aspect. Very but much so. I think that's something that, you know, since there are some of us from different organizations, both national and local, maybe we could um, enter into some discussion about whether that could work and how. Um, mission has changed for the military. When I'm down at Fort Bragg at the, at the Air Museum, and in order to get my poster, I had to fill out a comment card. And I said, when did the mission for freedom and justice for all change to the tents of what profit for the few, corporate profit for the few? And it's really been missing that we, we have, we talked about the military, we talked about the religious issues, we haven't really addressed global corporate. Mm -hmm. And like, there's a tremendous tension in the globe right now. There's, you know, we have governments, but you know, who really runs this planet, right? Mm -hmm. You know? And um, so that was something that really, I think, is worth delving back into the influence of like private interests in all these countries. You know, um, I think the deaths in New York were horrible um, on a certain level. You know, after 50 years of U.S. foreign economic policy manipulating other cultures, you almost could expect some type of whip back. There's that, there's, that's a whole nother bag. Why did that happen? What are we doing elsewhere? Why are the people fighting for things? You know, that's part of what we need to come to grips with. Mm -hmm. um, on the religious issue, um, it's it's more than, I, I mean, in the South, you're dealing with religion for sure in the military. But but even, even in Christianity, it breaks down even further. I heard this person, Chuck. I mean, there's a, the, the woman you engage with, Era, you know, um, there is a war Christianity. You know, like, you know, God is on our side. God, he... That's I mean, an oxymoron. Yes. Huh? Yeah. That's an oxymoron. Yeah. Like, you know, but God is on our side. Right. It's, like, it, it's like, it's not just a faith-based issue. It's like an entrenched belief that we're fighting for everything that's right and God is on our side. So that's a whole nother nut to crack rather than just engaging more, you know, thoughtful, progressive, you know, even religious. Even evangelical communities split now. There right. Are a lot of forces in there. The, 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 right. the religious community is split across the board. And so we 
do have real allies to deal with. I think we're going to uh, have to eat and greet now, as Allison reminds <laughs> me. Well, uh, we have a, uh, I think it's time for us to just meet each other uh, on one-on-one. -on -one. There's a ton of food out here. We need to eat it, so you can't leave until you eat. Um, <coughs> and wine. Wine. Oh um, so <laughs> thank, thanks to our panelists. <laughs>